Hi, this is The Daily Overpass. My name is Eric and I make apps. Now today I want to talk about taking a leap of faith. Okay, so today I want to talk about leaps of faith. Now every time I've like advanced in my life, like personally, it's been because I've taken like a leap of faith. Like there's been a difficult decision and there was a safe option and a leap of faith option. The safe option, you know, being, you know, do what's expected and the, the, the leap of faith being the scary one. And a lot of times it was really scary. So, you know, a few weeks, like about a month ago, I, I told you about how I came to the, came to England and I got a job in IT and I, um, you know, went from working in a dairy to, to having an IT job at Barclays Capital. Well, eventually I, I left Barclays. So I was there for like two years, you know, got, you know, all my qualifications, all my Microsoft certifications and everything. And then I moved on to a, a, another, like a smaller company. So it was like closer to home, you know, I didn't have to commute so much. So it was kind of nice. And we, and we had another baby on the way. And just, I moved to a, uh, I went to this new company uh, and um, it, it was not a good experience. I was there for, I was there for three years. Uh, and I was, I won't go into the details of it. I mean, cause it's, you know, it's everybody has horror stories of places they used to work. You might have them where, where you work too, but it was one of those kind of environments where it just felt like where well, you go in and it just felt like a weight being put on top of your shoulders, you know, like you just couldn't stand being there. You felt like you were constantly being watched and criticized and, and just, you know, uh, you know, just want to move on. And, you know, and it, it, it was, uh, you know, I, I started at a certain salary uh, for three years, never had a salary increase. And that was one of the issues, even though the company was sold, you know, the, uh, the man, it was only like, it was a small company, like seven people, but like, you know, one day the managing director drives in with a Porsche and I don't know if you've ever had to ask for a raise, but it's just, it's so difficult where you have to go hat in hand, you know, and say, excuse me, I'm just you know, wondering if, you know, if I could get a raise and I, Ooh, Eric. Yeah. Our policy is to pay the market average. So, you know, regardless of how long you've been here. Uh, so it was, it was one of those situations where I don't want to, I mean, if you, dude, man, if you get me started, I will tell you like loads of things, you know, horror stories, but I'm sure they've got, you know, horror stories about me because I don't know if you've ever worked at a place where there's somebody who's just like, man, this sucks. This, you know, this job, this is terrible. All this kind of stuff. I'm ashamed to say at the, at, eventually it got to be, I was that guy. Like I should have left long before I did. But, uh, so what I had done was, uh, like after working there, like, I think it was probably six months, I went home to San Diego and, uh, you know, to visit my family. And I told everybody who would listen how terrible my job was and all that kind of stuff. And they were like, oh, you should quit. I said, yeah, I should. I, and then I went back and then, you know, over the next few years, I, you know, I sent out CVs, I, you know, I, I had interviews, I did all this kind of, try to find something to move to another permanent job. And, uh, you know, uh, you didn't find any, I mean, the, this was like the dot, the dot com bubble bursting, right? So there was, there were no jobs that I could find. So, uh, so, you know, and then like, you know, so it has been two, two years later after my first trip to San Diego, I go back and everybody asked, Hey, so Eric, what are you doing now? And I said, I'm, I'm working at this company. And I said, so were you working there before? And I said, yeah, I, said, I thought you hated it there. And I said, yeah, but there's no jobs out there and all this kind of stuff. And it was just, you know, victim, 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 right? So on the plane home from San Diego, it was on my own, uh, you know, I, I came up with this idea and I kind of started sketching these ideas that I will make them like, I'll make them, I'll ask for a raise, but I'll put together like a presentation, like a proposal saying why I should get that raise, right? So, and uh, you know, and if they don't, then I'll, I'll move on because at that point I was kind of at the point, I was, I was like, I don't care if I lose this job, right? So, uh, so that, so I, did a few sketches of paper and then like th I woke up early the more first day I was due back at work uh, you know after my holiday uh, and I just sort of wrote up this like five or six page presentation of why I needed this raise and I put like a, a figure there uh, and uh, you know basically saying you know this is the rate of inflation so I had charts and graphs you know the rate of inflation my salary uh, you know the um, you know the additional you know stuff that I've taken on the the, the amount I've grown since I've been there uh, you know all the additional responsibilities the, the the parts of the company that I was you know in charge of and all this kind of stuff and also looking at the revenue of the company which went from from nothing to you know a lot Right. So, uh, but they didn't, you know, so, and I, I brought this in, uh, into where, and then it was so strange because we had a meeting that morning. They talked about, oh, it's, you know, it's been so tough with Eric being gone because blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, yeah, whatever. And then I, I gave, so I gave him the, the I went in and I met with, uh, 
with the, the director and I gave him this proposal and he looked over, he goes, oh, okay. And he says, um, what can we, because when, whenever it asked for a raise or anything like that, it was always, we'll look at this in two to three months. So he looked at it and he said, hmm, so right, if we look at this over the next uh, two to three months, I said, no, and I read this book on negotiation. It's, this all seems pretty naive here, right? So I, I read this book on negotiation and I told him, uh, no, I need, a, I need an answer by the end of this week. And then he said, he looked at me and he says, do you have another job lined up? And okay, this is the part where the story kind of changes. This, is, this, this story has moments of, of courage and moments of cowardice. This is one of cowardice. So he says, do you have a job lined up? And I said, yes, right? <laughs> and then he asked, you know, he asked where, and I told, I gave like, I said walking, because I seen a sign like on the interstate or whatever, on the motorway, right? So, so, so then he said, yeah, he'll consider it. And so then, this week, I'm kind of waiting to hear back from them. So he went and discussed it with the other uh, two managing directors. So again, it was a small company, just like seven people. Uh, and then, and then I got a call from one of them saying, "We can't do this because it's our policy." Blah blah blah. And then he said, "But we can give like, um, like a bonus, like a small bit." It was just, it was really, it was really small. And I, I thought I had to stick to my guns, and I said. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to leave. Right. So, uh, so, so that was because you know it was at the time I was I'm, and uh, to be honest with you, I should have left years earlier. I wasn't doing them any favors. I wasn't doing me any favors. Uh, but at the time, I was just you know bitter. So I, so I, so I left. So I gave my notice that day. So I had a 30-day notice and a pretend job to go to. So I had no job lined up, and it was uh, it was the most scary time of my entire life. So. I served out this notice period, uh, and you know it's really hard to find a job or like to go to interviews when you when you already have a fake job that you're supposed to be going because you have no excuses. So, so over the course of the next month of the, the notice period, I kept, you know, I, then I was really looking for a job. I was doing CVs every day, sending them out to everyone. I was going to any interview that I could get to. I went to go see uh, one uh, recruiter. I don't know why he had to see me in person, but and he he looked at me. He says. He says, are you telling me you left a perfectly good job in this market? And I was, that, was a, that was the most scary thing. I thought, this is the, you know, I really, really made a mistake, right? Uh, and, um, and I said something about, you know, I have you know, confidence in my abilities and all this kind of stuff. Something because I, I, was, I was shaken by what he had said. So in the end, so the month passes and we have my leaving due. And my leaving due is just, it was, it was just, it was sad because it was like, you know, they gave me a gift, a you know, big speech. Eric, where are you going on to? I'm giving him this BS story, which I think by now everybody knew was BS, right? They knew I didn't have a job to go to, which is why they would never, you know, you know, they all they had to do was wait. All they had to do was wait for me to come back and beg for my job back. So I left, and then you know, the next day, and then I started really searching for a job, and. I started, uh, you know, doing CVs every day. I had no money, I had no job, I had no savings, uh, and uh, and I'm the only breadwinner of the family. So you know, a wife and two kids at the time, uh, and you know, and and no income. And I did have a project that I was doing freelance, which was like eleven hundred dollars and I or eleven hundred pounds, and I was, uh, you know, which which I finished because I had loads of free time uh, when I wasn't looking for a job, and then also I. Um, we borrowed some money so but it was it was a point where people were, you know it was people were asking you know when i said i couldn't afford to go out or anything like that they were saying oh you lost your job and again the lie just you know for you know, i said yes because i didn't have i didn't have the courage to tell them that i had left a perfectly good job and put my family in in danger really and I had two little boys with their bright little faces looking up at me, and and you know they you know they liked the fact that I was home, but it was I really felt like a failure. I felt like a you know like felt like a failure as a father. I felt like a failure as a husband and a failure as a man because you start looking at other people and everybody has a job, and you start thinking I'm you know and and I just left and I was you know trying so hard to find one and every interview I went to I was desperate like I was desperate for the job so I was trying to find a contract I was trying to be a contractor because uh, I figured if I had to be contractor permanent I wanted to be a contractor and uh, but I'd go to things and to, uh, to interviews and they said well 
you know, you don't really want to be a contractor. You, you be employee, employee. And I said, yeah, sure. Cause I would take even less money. Right. At that point I was just desperate. And it, again, as you know, this is the, the, the cowardice comes in a little bit here is I wish I could just say it was a bold leap of faith, but there were times where I would kind of leak the fact back to the, the old company that maybe the other job had fallen through or something like that. Uh, hoping that they would, and they said, oh, well, you know, I'll talk to some people, see if we can get you your job back. And I was like, yeah, and, but my wife was like, you know, why would you go back there? You know, she, by the way, this is, this is one of the, the situations where you feel like you're alone and you realize, hey man, we're, we're a team and everybody was just backing, backing me up. And it was, and then I, yeah, I said, I'm gonna have to get a job at a gro at the uh, Weight Rose. Weight Rose is like, in the UK, it's like a grocery store chain. So I was gonna get a job at Weight Rose. Uh, to to pay the bills uh, and I, I set a deadline of like a month and uh, and that whole month no jobs it was just like it was it was terrible I mean I met with companies that said you know uh, you know we can get you an interview someplace but you have to swear you don't look for a job anywhere else and I said yes which was a lie because I still kept looking for a job right it was my it was my life on the line it was my family it was all that kind of stuff so and strangely you know I get a you know, after a month and after like my deadline, almost at the end of my deadline, I get a call from a, a, a recruiter that says, uh, you know, to come in for an interview in London. And then I get a call from another recruiter saying, come to another interview in London. So I went down and I, and I took this test at the recruitment office and they said I did better than all the other candidates and everything. And so I, uh, and then the other recruiter said, we want you to meet today. And I said, I can't, I'm in another interview. And they said, okay, meet tomorrow. So I had this two interviews lined up. And then I went to uh, so I went to the first one, which is at BBC Worldwide, and I went and met with them, and uh, and it was it went it went well. They offered me the job uh, the next day, uh, so my first contract, which was a short one, it was only like ten weeks, right? And uh, and then the next the next day, uh, the, the the other company, uh, it wasn't until the next day that the BBC offered me. So I went to the other interview, and they'd offered me more money for a longer contract, but I had already accepted the BBC. But it was like whew. Right, it was like Christmas was saved because it was. You know, I'm thinking, you know, we're not gonna have Christmas, we're not gonna have anything like that. You know, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, it was really. It's a feeling that I would not wish on my worst enemy. So I, so I worked at BBC. And like before the end of that contract, I'd found another contract because I didn't know that they normally extend. That was my first contract. So when they came to me to extend, I said, I've already got something else, and I went to go work at an investment bank at BNP Paribas. And then it was like, it was like big money. So within a course of, I guess, four months, I had doubled the amount that I was making, you know, just like that. But I was also not going to be in that situation again. So, so, so from then on, that was like, that was my last permanent job. And that was that huge leap of faith, which for the longest time, it felt like it was the biggest mistake I've ever made in my life. And that's just because I hadn't seen it to the end yet. Right. It was, um, it was there's a book called uh, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway by Susan Jeffers, where one of the things she talks about says, no matter what happens, you'll handle it. You always do. Right. And it's something I always think about. You know, you get it. Sometimes you have to put yourself in a situation where you have nothing to lose or you have, you know, your back is to the wall and you have to do things you wouldn't normally do. And that was one of those situations where I did. So from there, I worked, you know, many contracts so, you know started that was when i started up overpass i started all that kind of stuff i would work a contract and i would you know like other contractors would spend all their money and i was like constantly saving i was like i was getting ready to be out of work again and it was it was sort of like what i took away from that situation is I will never put myself in a situation again where somebody is in control of my education, where somebody is in control of my future, where someone else is in control of my finances. Right? One of the things as a contractor that was really liberating was that I was, you know, when I wanted to, to work on a new technology, it was my responsibility to learn it. When I wanted to do something new, it was my responsibility. When, and when I think back to that company that I was so jilted and, 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 and couldn't stand being at, it was their not. It was not their responsibility to make sure that my work was rewarding. It was not their responsibility to make sure that I was paid enough. It was not, you know, their responsibility to make sure I had a secure job. Really, right? It was that was my responsibility. And one of the best things about being a contractor, as being as opposed to being an employee, is that a contract has an end date, right? It has this. Um, you know, I know that when I take on a contract for six months on December fifteenth, it's over. So. I have to start preparing 
financially and emotionally right, to, to be out of work, right? And you don't know how long that's gonna go. But the fact of the matter was I would take on a contract and it would be like three years, I'd be three years in a contract, they keep renewing and in the end I had to leave, right? I would leave because I said I wanna start off my own agency or my own uh, software company and like I said, I would go and I would sit at my desk at home and I was too scared to cold call people because that was the next leap of faith, right? So I would eventually, you know, after a few months go back and find another contract. But it was, it was one of those things, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish that feeling on, on my worst enemies, that being out of work. Some of you guys have been there before. You've been, you know, whether you were, you were pushed or you jumped, you know, you're in that situation where you're out of work and you're trying to, to, make, it, to make it and you look at everybody else around you and having a job is just like a normal thing, right? And, uh, and to, to leave that mentality is really, really hard. I was at a, um, uh, I was at a school dance for one of my kids, a di school disco, and I met with somebody who I, I'd met at the dairy, although I didn't remember him, he remembered me. And he was talking about the job that he had for, after the dairy had closed, he'd had it for like eight years, uh, but then that left, but he's got a new job, and he's hoping that the new job lasts for 10 years. And my whole thing was, dude, man, I would never want a job that lasted 10 years, right? Well, if I'm in a contract for two years, I feel like, man, I, I, gotta, I gotta move on. I'm, you know, things are you know, getting stale here. Right. Anyway, so the reason I, I'm thinking about that today, and I'm sorry for the long story again. You know, it's you know, it's boring. One of these days, I'm gonna, you know, it's going to be really therapeutic here. I'm going to tell you about the time I wet my pants in the second grade or whatever. So you know, but yeah, you know, I'm thinking about now because now the thing that's holding me back, the next big leap, and it's something that I know has been there. You know, we all have these things that we know this is what we should do, but it's scary. Like for me, the big thing is overpass is small. Like we have so much client work coming in, we got so much opportunity, but overpass is small and the problem relies with me. It's me getting ready to make that next big leap and I have to decide whether or not I'm ready to do that. Do I take the safe option, which is just stay small, or do I take the big leap and grow? And I'm not, I'm never good with the big leaps, you know? Like I, I wish I could say it was a big bold leap, but no, it's big bold leap and scratching and clawing, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, trying to get back and, and second guessing myself and all that kind of stuff. I think about my little brother. When we were kids, we would like have bike, you know, bike ramps and stuff out on the street where we jump our bikes off of. My brother would straight away jump right off a, off a, off a ramp and I would go like to the edge, put on the brakes and look down and say, no, nah, I'm not doing that, right? Because I just, I don't have that. I can't just dive off the diving board the first time. I'm constantly rethinking myself. And a lot of times the, the reason it takes so long to get to where I want to go is because of self-confidence issues, which I, I hope we all have. I hope it's not just me. Anyway, sorry for the long story. That's it for today. I will talk to you guys on Monday.